So today I'd like to uh, talk to you about why science needs diversity. And by diversity, I mean a diverse set of scientists. And, um, you know, when you think about um, diversity, uh, it's not just because it's a good thing or it's um, a, a, an ethical responsibility, and those are good reasons. But in this case, I want to specifically make the point that science will be better when we have diverse scientists. <clears throat> so we're told that science is objective, and largely it is objective. Um, but there are two aspects of science that are decidedly not very objective, that are more a product of the scientist and the human element and the background of the science and the scientist. And that is one, the path chosen and the questions we choose to answer as scientists. And the second thing is how we go about answering those questions. So, and those two elements are very important and they, in some sense, define what we're going to find out. So, in my work, I've worked for, uh, on Darwin's finches, I'm an evolutionary ecologist, I've uh, worked on this uh, system for about 20 years, uh, and I've seen in my own work how my background is reflected in the science that I do. So, um, I'm a first-generation student from a blue-collar family, and I tend to generate large data sets and ask questions that cut across fields, uh, and I like to think that sometimes this leads to novel insights. Um, but um, in general, I could see how my background is reflected in my science, but I don't know if that's going to convince you today, so I, I'm going to talk about uh, perhaps the greatest scientist of all time, Charles Darwin. And I'll bring you two examples that I think uh, uh, show that Darwin's background affected his science. So during the time of Darwin, um, the prevailing wisdom was that species were immutable. Species didn't change. They were created as is and they just persisted and they went extinct. So Darwin's great contribution, of course, was to show us how that, number one, that species did change and then how they changed through natural selection differential reproduction and survival. And things that changed were like the beak of the finch. So um, this was Darwin's great contribution, but why was it Darwin who came up with this? And basically, I think you can make an argument that at the time, the world was ready for a change. So the French scientist Cuvier was one of the ones responsible for this idea of stasis. Species didn't change. And this was the dominant thought of the day, and they worked at keeping it the dominant thought. So Darwin, though, had in his background his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, who spent a lot of time, he was a free thinker, and he spent a lot of time questioning the notion of stasis, that species didn't change. Now, he didn't come out on the right side of the issue, he didn't figure out how evolution occurred, but the seeds were there. He planted those seeds in, in Charles Darwin, and I believe that's why Charles Darwin chose the path that he did, asked the questions that he asked. So Charles Darwin uh, traveled to the Galapagos on the Beagle, uh, at where he, there's the Beagle, uh, and he collected about 25 finches uh, that later bore his name. Uh, we work on these finches, these exact specimens in my lab. We do genetic analysis on them, and we've shown that a lot of them have disappeared, the, the populations, and diversity has been, has been lost since the time of Darwin. <clears throat> uh, and as you can tell, this is a picture of the Galapagos, and th it is a very, very rugged landscape. But one thing that Darwin noticed in Galapagos, and he put this together largely after he returned back to England, he noticed that all these forms in Galapagos were different from their mainland cousins. So he could see the clear relationships between the species in Galapagos and the ones in the mainland, yet they differed in subtle ways. Then even in Galapagos, he noticed, from one island to the next, 
that species differed uh, 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 over very short geographic distances. So this had a very profound effect on him, uh, and he used a couple examples in his great book, The Origin of Species. Uh, one here is a, the tortoise. Uh, on some islands, they have a dome carapace. On other islands, they have a more saddleback carapace. Uh, and these islands are within sight of each other. Another example he used was the mockingbirds. In this case, maybe you can guess which one of these forms came from the island that also has giant cactus with tasty leaves way up high. So it's the one on the right that's better adapted to eat those leaves, or so it might be. It seems to be. So, but Darwin really wanted to use the finches as an example in his book, and this is shown in his notes. He, he, he thought, wow, look at all this diversity in Galapagos, different beak shapes, uh, probably came from different islands, but he couldn't use them. He made a rookie error. In fact, he made an error that not even a rookie scientist would make today. He did not label his specimens as to which island they came from. So he feverishly is back in England uh, trying to reconstruct where these finches came from, and he can't do it. And eventually, he can't use them as an example in his book. So the question is, why did Darwin make such a bad mistake? So this is a shot of uh, one of the islands in Galapagos. Maybe you can uh, figure out where one of our campsites is, right there. Um, so maybe it's that Galapagos is a rugged place, and it is. It's hard to land your stuff there. It's hard working over land, walking up to the tops of the mountains to get to the birds. Uh, it is a lot of work. So maybe Darwin just got tired and, you know, was distracted by all the ruggedness. Actually, this is an exceptionally rugged place. Our party was attacked here by one of the rarest mammals on Earth. Uh, three of us were wounded, drew blood, uh, and there was a battle where, um, there it is, there's the evil critter right there. <laughs> this is the Galapagos rice rat. Oh, he's right there, look, he's, he's about to tear into that, that finger. So I can't explain how that happened, <laughs> that's another story. But the bottom line is, it is a pretty rugged place. And, but I don't think that's what caused the problem for Charles Darwin. Another possibility is, he may have just misplaced his pencil. and uh, forgot about his pencil for a couple islands or something like that. But uh, I don't think that's the case either. What I think it was is his history and the prevailing thought of the time. So how could these two islands that are so close together harbor different forms? If these were two hillsides in England, there would be no reason to expect any differences on this scale. Now, of course, we do expect differences on this scale, but not back then. So the point here is that Darwin's history and the context affected how he conducted his science in a way that is almost unimaginable today. So if science, this causes you to think, okay, so if your background affects the science you do and what you choose to investigate, um, what about the background of scientists? Why, you know, if, they're all, if they all have the same background, are they going to ask all the questions in science that need to be asked? So ideally, in science, you'd like science to go out in all directions. So if science were hair, maybe this is an idea of what good science would look like, going out in all directions. So we'd want more Whippy Goldberg, less alfalfa. Okay? We'd want, even better than Whoopi, we'd want more science like Medusa, twisting, exploring every angle, and less Zippy the Pinhead. You can go look that up later. <laughs> um, so what I'm saying here is that these bald spots on Zippy's head are unexplored avenues. 
And we need scientists of more diverse backgrounds to ask those questions and explore those avenues. So this is a look at the Royal Society around the time of Darwin. A rather homogeneous lot. Here it is 100 years later. This is the best, you know, the most renowned scientific body on the planet. And here it is more recently. You know, maybe it's a little better. But I look at these pictures and I say, we can do better. There is science out there that's not being done because we don't have the diversity that's asking those questions. So, two remedies to leave you with. One, scientists have to be more willing to go out and get those other perspectives. And they can get it. This is some humanities faculty from Cal State Chico. Uh, we have faculty here at UC. Uh, they have those diverse perspectives, and they study that. And those collaborations could be valuable for science, and I know they will be. Do you know 80% of, of Nobel Prize winners in science have attributed their innovation to studying the arts? Or they could at least make that connection that their innovative ability was fueled by their study of the arts. And that's a big number. Second recommendation, I challenge you, all you people, rise and reimagine yourselves if you're young and still able to become a scientist. If you're older, collaborating, saying science is part of your, what you can contribute to as well. But the little ones around you, we need them in science. We don't, don't just encourage them, we should beg them to become scientists because they will produce better science in the end. And I firmly believe that. So the less you look like a classic scientist, maybe the more valuable you will be to the future of science. So with that, um, thank you. <laughs>